I guess we'll get started. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I think we got a really special program um, for our final roundtable of the uh, of the of 2015. I guess you'd call it. Um, before we do, um, my, my name is Kim Brigham, I'm um, class of Bonner School, 1970. But there are. Um, some people in here I, I would like to recognize myself. I've got the brown shirt, but that's kind of an a honorary thing, I guess. The people, uh, other people in the brown and blue shirts here today are from the Bonner History, Bonner, Milltown History Center and Museum Group. They're the heavy lifters of events like this and also the museum down in the old post office, which people of my age and others remember as George's Cafe. Um, and so if if I could get you people, <laughs> you people, to uh, just stand up and uh, I won't I won't take too much time but please stand up and be acknowledged for the efforts that you guys do. Like I say I just kind of show up. Um, Judy make sure. <laughs> Somewhere in, come on Glenn, stand up. Come on, Anna. <laughs> in the background. Oh, yeah, you gotta do it. This has been going on now for, I think, six years. And, uh, it gets better and better. Somewhere in San Francisco, Miney Smith should be standing as well. And, uh, Miney uh, um, couldn't make it this time, and it's probably the one that she wanted to be at the, wor at the most. Um, she wrote the book on the mercantile, the Missoula Merc. Um, a few announcements. Uh, the most important one, the bathroom right around the corner, discreetly located behind that wall if you haven't been here before. Um, thanks for the St. Anne Catholic Church um, for providing this location. It works real well for these, these gatherings. Um, we, Father Mike Poole can't be here today. He likes to come to these things. Um, and he is a, uh, a Butte guy. He's one of, the, one of the good things that Butte shipped down the river to Bonner. Um, <laughs> and uh, and he, he, he lets us open the doors to these things. Um, and uh, basically, I guess we try to have three, uh, three a year and the previous two this year, one, one was the Timberjack movie that end, we showed in the Bonner School uh, gym, and I don't know how many of you are here for that, but there was, what, 250, 300 people at, at that thing? And it was a great event. And then two months ago, we had the uh, Foresters of the Champion, or the Anaconda, Champion, and Stimson Mill eras. Well, we left one era out, and today we're going to cover that era, the first era of, of uh, Bonner, the Bonner Mill, and that would be the Hammond era. Um, speaking of the church, we have on tap, after this meeting at 4 o'clock, a pasty feed. Pasties, uh, Butte pasties, uh, Father Poole's special recipe, will be available um, to eat here or to take home. It'll be um, $5 for a pasty or $7 for a pasty dinner, which includes gravy and uh, coleslaw, I believe. So that'll be immediately when we're done here. Um, we like to thank MCAT, um, Missoula Community Access TV, for again being on our presence, or being here, being present to film the, the uh, proceedings. You can all watch yourself on TV. Um, I don't even know the regular scheduled times, but uh, that's channel 189 and 190 now. Um, another announcement, Forestry Day at Fort Missoula, very appropriate to the people out here. Um, next Saturday, Saturday, April 25th, from 10 to 4 o'clock. Um, Scott Keen is the is the Scott just came in. He's the guy on the poster. <laughs> the cab of the Willamette locomotive will be open that day. 
You can go up in the locomotive. And we don't call it the Shea, right? No. It's not the Shea. Okay. <laughs> Um, another announcement, uh, Ashley Parks, the principal at Bonner School, will be at the History Center, um, the Old George's Cafe, um, by the Bonner Post Office on Tuesday, April 21st, so this coming Tuesday, to talk about the, uh, the school bond issue, um, where they are attempting to expand the cafeteria that was built in 1957, and a lot of you probably have um, spilled food, had food fights in that cafeteria. <laughs> I look at you, Glenn. <laughs> that was after your time, right? Ice cream the window. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nick, speaking of Glenn, uh, Glenn is going to be talking at the university history group next Friday night at 7 o'clock um, about the history of the Bonner Mill, correct? That's the topic. So. One of our own is going to be uh, going into town and, and uh, expounding, I guess, on, on a lot of the things that uh, happened out here. It's in the business end of the building. The Gallagher building, do you remember the room number? 119. 119. We have a lot of the... 7 o'clock and there's a construction site nearby, so come uh, 20 minutes early. One, one more thing, well, two more things, but this, another thing is um, on display here at the table and on sale are the books uh, that Greg Gordon uh, produced, came out last year about A.B. Hammond. And the title of it, I keep, it's right here. When, when Money Grew on Trees, A.B. Hammond and the Age of the Timber Baron. You'll get a taste of what this book is about, but it's a, it's a page turner. I guarantee it for a bio, for a biography, it's um, it's something else, especially for the people. Uh, I guess the people that come to things like this, <laughs> it's worth it's worth it. So, I, are they signed books? Or? I I can. They're blind for hands. Okay, they can be signed. Can be personalized. <laughs> I, I I highly recommend it. And finally, um, today is well, not today, but Dennis Mer Dennis saying birthday is well my, I, I thought my note said that Dennis turns 18 today but I think it means your birthday was on the 18th, yeah, on the 18th. which was yesterday yeah. and which one is it do you want to say 75 75 okay you're doing good okay we don't have to sing happy birthday right no okay. <laughs> We have a distinguished panel here today. Um, Dale Johnson of Missoula retired. He was the first archivist at the University of Montana's Mansfield Library. Greg Gordon of Spokane now, assistant professor of environmental studies at Gonzaga University. Have a lot in common. Both came to Missoula uh, to go to school. Dale came from Billings if I'm mis not mistaken, in accounting in 1955. Got a part-time job at the Merck. Um, Greg came from Denver in 1989 to attend graduate school to get his master's in environmental sciences. Dale, after a two-year hitch in the military, returned to Missoula and the Merck he went teaching in Laurel for a couple of years and then came back here to stay. At the university, he worked on an advanced degree in history. Ross Toole was his mentor, and one of, one of Toole's tasks was to establish the archives at the university, at the Mansfield. One of the first collections that he obtained was, were the papers of the Missoula Mercantile Company. When Dale was looking for a subject for his dissertation, Andrew Hammond was the obvious choice, and that dissertation um, was accepted toward his degree in 1976. For those of us that have tried to do any research at all on on Andrew Hammond in the in in the, that interim, or on Edward Bonner, um, on a lot of those 
those areas. Um, that's been and that's been the gospel, I guess, in the Missoula area. Um, there's copies at the at both libraries, and uh, and it centers, I think, m mainly on his Hammond's dealings in Missoula, in Montana. Greg um, remained in Missoula after he got his master's, and in 2010 received his PhD in history. Um, that was a special time he was just telling me, and would you mind kind of explaining the connection here in that way? Um, sure, does that, does that work? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Um, and Dale, jump in if I'm mistaken on this, but I believe you were probably one of the first people to get your PhD in history from the University of Montana, and then not too long after you received your degree that the history PhD program sort of went into hiatus, if you will, for 40 years or something like that. And it was resurrected in about 2005, 2004, 2005, um, and that's when I decided to go back to school um, and get my doctorate. Um, and then I was the first graduate of the resurrected UM PhD program after having it sort of, and you may have been the first of the, f one of the first generation <laughs> of that program, is that right? Yeah, I was not the first, but I was among them. Right, yeah. so kind of a cool connection. And, and Greg, if I'm not mistaken, who, who was the impetus, Dan Flores was the impetus for, you, for your turning you on to A.B. Hammond, correct? Right. And, and Dan Flores was the um, A.B. Hammond, tell me, tell me the right name. Yeah, A.B. Hammond Chair of Western History, which was, K. Ross Toole was the first one. Then, um, um, Hampton. yeah, Dwayne Hampton, second, and then uh, Dan, Dan. Then Dan was the third. And they're currently looking for the fourth one. With that, I'd like to ask all the Hammonds in the crowd to stand up. <laughs> We've got it. And if I'm not mistaken, you come from the George Hammond lineage. A.B.'s brother. A.B.'s brother, and George was, um, well, maybe Dale can fill us in more on, on George's as time comes along. He was very instrumental in what went on here. Okay. <laughs> We're going to start out with um, the PowerPoint show that Greg has put together, and we're going to intersperse it, as I understand, with comments from Dale. And um, at that, at Dennis Sane has the traveling mic, and if you guys don't mind, questions come up raised during the presentation. Feel free to raise your hand. We'll get to the mic and. Uh, Identify yourselves if you remember to, <laughs> and uh, speak loudly into the mic. Um, remember, you are on camera. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kim. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming to hear about uh, E.L. Bonner, right? Edward Bonner um, and A.B. Hammond. Um, and I like the idea of it being sort of a casual conversation. Um, you know, so if, again, if people have questions, just feel free to feel free to ask, interject, and we'll uh, we'll see what we can um, we, we'll see what we can answer, and if not, we'll just make it up. Um, <laughs> it's really an honor to be here with, with Dale. Uh, if it wasn't for Dale, I I would still be looking at microfilm. Um, you know, I I was ha sort of handed this project um, unbeknownst. Um, and didn't really know anything about A.B. Hammond. I looked at the, found there was this dissertation sitting in the archives and I checked it out and read through it and, um, and went into the archives one day and somebody said, oh, Dale's right here. And so, uh, you know, we, we met and um, started talking and he said, well, I have everything for you. And I said, really? He said, yeah, I'll come back next week. So I came back next week and he handed me, you know, this file, small file cabinet of every reference that the Missoulian had ever printed on A.B. Hammond, Montana Improvement Company, Bonner, I don't know, 
an immense amount of information that he collected all in, in maps and, and documents from the National Archives and I just thought and it was just here take it <laughs> I don't want to see it I don't know if you said that I don't want to see it <laughs> but he had hold, held on to it he must have known I was coming for, for what 40 years nearly yeah um, so it was an incredible it was an incredible gift um, and I can't begin to express uh, how appreciative I am it, trying to do research on Hammond uh, was tough because there's not a lot there and so Dale sort of paved the way and sort of opened it up and and describes his Missoula years and so what I thought it would do is give a little background of um, his childhood um, and then uh, let Dale talk about the Missoula years and I can kind of pick it up after the Missoula years and of course um, as you all know you know Bonner is named after E.L. Bonner and uh, I think between Bonner and Hammond Eddie and Higgins um, you know, Missoula Bonner Milltown sort of owe their existence and if it wasn't for those uh, that gang if you will uh, gang of four can we call them that <laughs> Um, that it really, really made Missoula into the place it is. Uh, you know, uh, Hammond and Bonner brought the Northern Pacific um, to Missoula. Um, they were both sort of instrumental in getting the university here, and of course, the Missoula Mercantile Company. Um, so, uh, again, I thought, I thought I'd just give a little background on how Hammond got here, um, a little bit. Um, and one thing that was interesting sort of when I started doing the research I discovered that so many people uh, from in, in Missoula area western Montana came from New Brunswick right the Hammonds the Keys the McLeods um, even Thibodeau Sear we have names that sort of go back to the French uh, Madawaska area of the borderland between New Brunswick um, and Maine and I didn't realize that so many of sort of the uh, 19th century citizens of the area came from New Brunswick. Um, so it's kind of curious. So I actually um, went to New Brunswick and dug through the archives there to try to find out what was going on in New Brunswick that compelled all these people um, to come to this sort of corner of the world. Um, so uh, Madawaska is sort of a border region. Uh, between sandwich between Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Maine, uh, sort of a no man's land that was mostly French Catholic, but it was run by uh, New, New Brunswick provincial authorities, uh, who were Anglo Saxon Protestant. And Hammond's grandfather uh, was the magistrate, um, the sort of the only English speaking person in New Brunswick, but he could also speak French. So interesting enough, Hammond grew up speaking French and being taught by Jesuits. Uh, so he had this connection to French Catholics, and of course, you know, once he arrives in Missoula, he becomes good friends with Father Rivali um, and Cataldo, and gets, I think, one of his, one of the maybe things that attracted him to, uh, or attracted that sort of sold Bonner and Eddie on hiring this guy may have been that he could speak French to uh, a lot of the uh, Mati people who had settled in in the Missoula Valley. So that's kind of speculation on my part. Um, anyway, um, he grew up sort of in a privileged position, again, as the grandson of the local magistrate. Um, New Brunswick for hundreds of years had, was a timber colony for British Empire. And their economy rested on logging the white pine on both sides of the international border with little regard to ownership or jurisdiction. His grandfather actually kicked off what was known um, as, um, what's the name of that brief little war between U.S. and Canada that sort of, I uh, can't think of it now. Um, it'll come to me. Um, anyways, a border dispute be over timber. And one of the things that was going on there is people on both sides of the border would poach timber. They, they, New Brunswick, they'd cross over into Maine and cut the timber and sit it down the St. Johns River. Um, the people in Maine would cross over into New Brunswick, cut down the river, cut down the timber and sit the river. So it was this, this culture of timber poaching. Um, and uh, the, um, growing up, Hammond was a part of this. Um, he left home at 16 to go work in the timber camps. 
Um, but he and his brother George really wanted to go to Colorado to go become gold miners and strike it rich. They had this, so they had heard about the gold strikes in California, sort of grew up with that. Um, 1859, they hear the gold strikes in, in Colorado. Uh, they get excited um, and they uh, decide to head out um, to, um, to Colorado. They end up at St. Joe, Missouri and they find out that maybe they should go up to Montana instead. So they head up the Missouri River um, and they, um, by the time they're going up the river on the steamboats, all the people are coming back down from the gold fields of Montana, uh, 1867, are essentially saying, hey, it's all gone, right? The gold fields are all played out, you know, it's really all the good strikes are taken and we're going home. And so they met all these people coming down the river on their way back, um, and Andrew decides right about Fort Peck that he's had enough of going up the river on a steamship. And um, he decides he's going to try his hand at becoming a woodcutter on the Missouri River. George, meanwhile, his older brother, continues on to Fort Benton where he gets a job supplying the army um, with, uh, with lumber. So they sort of, again, they've grown up in the lumber industry and they sort of take that, take that west. Um, Andrew ends up and again, uh, right in the middle of Missouri, in the middle of this struggle um, that's unfolding between the Blackfeet, the Sioux, the Assiniboine, and, um, and the contention on the Missouri is the fuel for the steamships. Um, the woodcutters are out there eagerly cutting down um, cottonwoods. Um, to, apply for, for, to provide fuel for the steamships traffic coming up and down the Missouri River. Um, the Indians, however, see this as intrusion. They become pretty agitated at these woodcutters that are cutting down what they see as their resources, um, their timber that they need for their bottomlands, for their horses, for their fires. Um, and it triggers a very short but intense uh, woodhawk war. Um, of 1866 to 1868, and in many ways this sets the stage for the rest of Hammond's life. Um, you know, the actors change, they go from Indians to settlers to the federal government, to competitors, to conservationists, but the issue is essentially the same issue that he faces throughout his life, is who's going to be in control of the access to um, the nation's forest. And uh, you can see here is a great picture of Fort Musselshell, is all um, uh, run by woodcutters, not really a fort, it's mostly a, a steamship um, stop. And if anybody's traveled up and down the Missouri r River, you can still see these old woodcutter cabins that are starting to sort of uh, decay back into, into the ground. 1868, um, you know, the Northern Pacific completes its line through to um, uh, transcontinental line through Utah, and all of a sudden it's easier to get supplies coming up from Utah than it is on the Missouri River, and the steamboat traffic basically comes to a grinding halt, and the woodcutters all leave, and um, that's sort of the end of the, the woodcutter war. But during that time, there was 58, uh, 58 woodcutters lost their lives in a 18 month span, and no one's not really sure how many uh, Sioux and Blackfeet, uh, Lakota and Assiniboine ended up losing their lives, but it was a pretty uh, bloody um, little, little two year span in that time. Um, 25 years later, A.B. Hammond controls every major business in western Montana, including First National Bank, the Missoula Waterworks, Missoula Street Railroad, the Missoula Gazette, the Florence Hotel, Downtown Blocks, Missoula Real Estate Association, the Bitterroot Railroad, the area only flour mill, the big Blackfoot milling company, and the cemetery. So how did he get from being a woodcutter to Western Montana's uh, most wealthy individual? And Dale will help us with that. Okay. <coughs> Interestingly, the Hammond chair at the University History Department, there were two things Andrew Hammond did not tolerate. One was unions. And the other was he no, was not particularly fond of education. And yet <coughs> his descendants left money to the university for this, through Walter McLeod. Walter McLeod is the one that got them to donate it. Um, to begin a little bit earlier, 
why don't we have a biography of Edward Bonner or Richard Eddy? Edward Bonner was probably during the early Hammond years more prominent. He's the one that worked with Sam Hauser, the territorial governor, to get the railroad uh, through Missoula and uh, he went back east to get capital both for all these uh, businesses they had around this part. Bonner and Eddy, Richard Eddy, they were both from New York and they came west in the 1850s and ended up settling in Walla Walla. Uh, Richard Eddy was more interested in agriculture, farming, than he was in business, but he and Bonner teamed up, had a pack train, hauled supplies for the miners and Indians in eastern Washington and northern Idaho. And as many of you probably know, Mr. Bonner ended up building a ferry across the Kootenai River up in northern Idaho, and uh, that's where Bonner's Ferry gets its name, is from Edward Bonner. Well, in 1865, they packed up their train and came over the Mullen Road to Missoula Mills. Opened a store, competitor with the Higgins and Worden store, which was called Worden and Company. They established their own store along with DJ Welch and it was called Bonner and Welch in the early years. Uh, in 1872, Hammond came back to the valley. He worked in Hellgate for a man uh, by the name of George White. George White uh, died and Hammond became the executor of the estate and closed out the business there in Hellgate. And Richard Eddy was so impressed with him as a, as a, a worker that he hired him for the bon, uh, Eddy, Bonner and Welch uh, store in Missoula in 1872, and Bonner was a clerk there then for years, or Hammond was a clerk there for a number of years. Bonner went on to Deer Lodge, which was a more promising location than Missoula in those days, and established a store. He later on uh, joined M.J. Connell to establish a store in Butte. They had uh, Bonner and Company, with their pack trains, would go to the various mining camps like Bear Gulch, set up a tent, sell their supplies, and then move out. Uh, and they did that all during the mining years. Hammond was so successful, and Eddie was <clears throat> Eddie was kind of the social person of the group. He helped establish the Rod and Gun Club in Missoula, helped establish the Missoula County Fair. Uh, he was not terribly interested in business dealings. How he and Bonner got together, I don't know. Why they stayed together for as long as they did, I don't know. Uh, but they did, and Eddie, Richard Eddy, after the Montana Improvement Company, Company fiasco, left for California and raised oranges. He bought an orange grove down in California, and that's where, after 1885, that's where he spent the rest of his life. Bonner lived in Deer Lodge for many years, and in the uh, early 1890s, he had quite severe heart problems and he retired from his businesses and that's when Hammond really became in charge of everything and uh, retired to his home on Gerald Avenue. Many of you are of an age where you remember the old Spotswood Mansion. That was really the Bonner Mansion. And uh, one of Bonner's daughters married a Dr. Spotswood and it became the Spotswood Mansion then. Bonner died in 1902 in probably one of Missoula's, if not their first auto accident, uh, certainly very early. He had a heart attack while he was driving down Higgins Avenue, and that was the end of Mr. Bonner. Uh, Hammond in 1877 
was brought into the company and they changed the name to Eddie Hammond and Company. Bonner never didn't have his name on all his investments. He was not quite as uh, insistent maybe as was Mr. Hammond. And uh, it operated as Eddie Hammond and Company then up until 1885 when they had to incorporate other things and go out of the partnership business. They were partners. And in the, when the timber suits came on, the partners were liable uh, by the federal government for their own personal fortunes to settle these timber suits. So Hammond and Bonner and Eddie and uh, other investors in, in Montana Improvement Company decided to establish separate corporations which would be detached from that and they would be stockholders and thus they would not be susceptible to having their fortunes taken. And that's when the Missoula Mercantile came into operation, the South Missoula Land Company, the Missoula Real Estate Company, uh, Florence Hotel Company came along a few years later, the uh, Missoula Valley Improvement Company, you might be interested in that. That's the cemetery. They owned that, uh, Hammond owned that too. And uh, why it was called an improvement company, you have your own uh, <laughs> ideas. Uh, he sold that to the county for a dollar later on in the 18, late 1890s, early 1900s when he was disposing of his Montana holdings. Uh, I won't go into the Montana Improvement Company. You can bring that in with your California uh, troubles. Uh, but he was, uh, he, he was a junior partner to Bonner much of the time, but he was the person that was in the news all the time uh, with regards to the bank. He and Higgins fell out over the bank. Uh, Hauser was the president of the bank and or the chief investor of the bank. Higgins was the president. And uh, they needed more capital, so they brought Hammond and Bonner into the ownership of the Missoula Bank in 1882. Well, Hammond immediately had problems with Higgins because Higgins was too liberal with his loans. And uh, Hammond uh, thought that things should be tightened up a bit. And so Hammond wrote Hauser and uh, told him that. Well, the thing evolved and evolved. Eventually what happened was uh, in 1888, Higgins was ousted and Marcus Daly was put in as president temporarily. Daly was in a lot of these things and ended up part owner of uh, Montana Improvement Company and later Bonner Mill. He didn't own uh, much of it as he did later on. But uh, in 1888, uh, the election for a territorial delegate came along and W.A. Clark the copper baron out of Butte wanted the legislature to put him in as the territorial delegate. Uh, Mr. Daly, of course, had a problem with Mr. Clark. And uh, Northern Pacific Railroad apparently had a problem with Mr. Clark. And the they, uh, election of 1888, why <coughs> Clark thought he was going to win. He was a Democrat, and uh, Hammond at that time was a Democrat. Daly, of course, was a Democrat, uh, and Hauser. Uh, but Clark thought he was going to win the election. Well, the election came along, and he did not win. Daly and all the people that worked for the NP, all the people that worked for the Hammond Enterprises, uh, all the people that worked for uh, the railroad, Hauser, Daly, 
they all voted for Thomas Carter for territorial delegate. And of course, this, uh, they went Republican. Now, one reason they went Republican probably is because uh, Benjamin Harrison's son was running the newspaper in Helena, and they thought, well, if we can get in with Russell Harrison, maybe we can, uh, and Benjamin Harrison, maybe we can get a favorable outcome of these uh, timber suits. Um, and they were kind of successful because the suits were dropped for many, many years, not settled until 1917. Uh, but that's when uh, Clark and, and Hammond fell out. Hammond, Daly, and Hauser went back to the Democratic Party. Hammond never did. He was always a Republican. And uh, Ty has an interesting story about when he went to work for the Mercantile, uh, that he was advised not to meet with the Democrats. Uh, so it survived for a long time, that attitude. There were some other things about Hammond and C.H. McLeod was his man on the spot, but every week, or more often, Hammond wrote him a letter telling him what to do, advising him of things. Hammond never really let go. And then in 1898, why uh, they sold the mill out here to Marcus Daly and the Anaconda Company. And up at the university archives is the guest register from the old Margaret Hotel. And in there, you look on the date, I think it was in August of 1898, and there is Marcus Daly's signature and some of the other ACM dignitaries that were involved in the purchase of Bonner Mill. I'll let you take over. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's just pick up with the Bonner Mill. That's kind of an interesting story between Daly, Bonner, um, or Hammond and, and Daly. Um, Daly wanted to buy that mill. I mean, Hammond and Bonner kind of built the Bonner mill. Well, maybe a backup here. Let's just back up. Um, so, talked about the Missoula Mercantile Company, um, and we can pick up on that a little bit. Um, but essentially, once uh, Eddie and Bonner brought Hammond into the fold. He kind of became the store manager, and Bonner, of course, goes on to Deer Lodge um, while Eddie goes fishing. And what happens next is really interesting, and actually, I, I've, I've never found an answer to this, so Dale, I want to ask you. Um, in 1883, the grocery store of the Missoula Mercantile Company gets a lumber contract to build in Northern Pacific Railroad from Miles City to Sandpoint, Idaho. We already have uh, McCormick or yeah McCormick Lumber Company, right? We have Higgins has a lumber company. There's several lumber companies in Missoula. How does a grocery store end up with a lumber contract? Bonner somehow is involved. Hauser's involved. The head engineer from Northern Pacific comes to Missoula after meeting with Hauser and Bonner, takes a train ride with Hammond up to the Flathead Lake, and when he comes back, Hammond has in his pocket a contract, exclusive contract, the only exclusive contract that Northern Pacific ever granted to a, ever, for anything. And here's a grocery store clerk with an exclusive contract to build the Northern Pacific Railroad. It's like if a guy who's running the butcher shop at Albertsons shows up with a contract to build a space shuttle. <laughs> How did that happen? Well, this is another source of the Higgins-Hammond fight. Higgins and Worden and Washington McCormick were uh, bonded together to give the NP property in Missoula. Originally, the railroad was to go over Marshall Grade. And uh, 
those three donated the land to get them to come through Missoula instead. Well then, uh, in all this, I think it was Bonner's connection really, that uh, through Hauser perhaps, that got the lumber contract for all the ties and, and the finished lumber that was needed to uh, go that route. Uh, you're right, Higgins had a sawmill. That was uh, roughly where the Hammond Arcade is now. And uh, I'm not sure about Washington McCormick. But somehow or other, they finagled the Northern Pacific to give them the contract rather than to Higgins and company. And that was sort of the start of their troubles. Um, well, we'll come back to the, the Missoula octopus there. Um, so there's the, you know, Eddie Hammond and, Co Eddie Hammond and Company there, Missoula Mercantile Company, 1885, um, shortly after they get the lumber contract. Um, so they get the contract to supply not just construction lumber, they, they get the contract to, per to grade the, the railroad bed, which they subcontract out. Um, they get the contract to supply all the housing, all the tents, all the blankets, all the tobacco, all the whiskey, everything that the railroad workers need, everything except steel. That was the one thing that the, that the um, Missoula Mercantile Company didn't provide. Part of the contract included a access to timber on Northern Pacific grant land. Um, and in order to get that timber, um, Hammond and his partners, Bonner, and I don't know if it was Eddie in the, in the improvement company? Yeah, in the early days. And um, the head engineer of the Northern Pacific Railroad was also one of the original incorporators of the improvement company, as was Marcus Daly. Um, and in order to do that, they sort of incorporated this new company to gain access to um, timber. And they got that legal right from uh, the, North, the original Northern Pacific grant going back to 1864. Oh, there it is. So part of that original railroad grant gave the railroad every other section um, from Duluth to Tacoma. Um, is an incentive to build the railroad so they could actually harvest timber to cut the cross ties, et cetera, to build the railroad. Um, and they interpreted adjacent rather loosely, um, cutting trees hundreds of miles away from the railroad right away. Um, some of the timber cut up in the Swan Valley, up the Blackfoot, um, up the Flathead uh, was um, interpreted as adjacent to the railroad. Um, and the government objected to some of these practices. And one of the problems they also had is the hadn't, land hadn't been surveyed. So no one could really tell what was federal land and what was railroad land. Um, that didn't bother Hammond at all. Um, and, but more and more people began to object to the use of the public timber for railroad construction. That could be overlooked, but they kept running the mills and kept selling timber after the railroad was completed. And that's where they got into trouble. They began exporting timber to the Midwest. They began exporting timber to Utah. And um, locals around the area began writing letters to the Secretary of Interior because the improvement company was threatening people going off and cutting timber for firewood or fence posts with jail. So you had the improvement company actually acting as if they were sheriffs in the state um, controlling the timberlands. Um, so, uh, upon a litany of complaint, Grover Cleveland administration filed 31 indictments against the Northern Pacific and the improvement company. There seemed to be some connection there, although that, uh, that connection seems rather fuzzy, um, for stealing more than $600,000 of public timber and the government charged him and Bonner et al. with fraudulently acqu acquired nearly 12,000 um, acres. Um, that seems to be one of the impetuses for the Hammond Daly feud in getting um, uh, Carter in place instead of um, um, Clark. And they end up, that works because um, Carter is successful in getting the suit suspended, as you said, from uh, 18, 
when did he get him suspended? About 1889, 1890, until 1917. So they go into a sort of a almost a 30-year hiatus. Um, so um, they got their money's worth out of Thomas Carter. Um, but the Bonner Mill, um, of course, built to provide the timber for the railroads in many ways. But um, the, that was sort of the original idea behind it, but it, it ends, ends up not being built until 1886. Um, and the primary customer for the Bonner Mill is Anaconda. So the Bonner Mill is providing you know, most of the timber, not just for building the construction, but building the mine timbers. Um, at that time, it's before the smelters are built, the coke smelters, so they're using wood as fuel for smelters, an immense amount of wood to melt rock, to extract copper. So by um, the 18, um, 1890s, um, Daly is really interested in acquiring the Bonner Mill rather than paying um, Hammond for um, the lumber and starts to look to acquire it. Um, Daly and Hammond have known each other now for 30 years and um, Hammond learns, he's learned how to play Daly along and he, he knows that if he dangles something in front of Marcus Daly, Daly will keep snatching at it. Um, so he's, Hammond sets the price of the Bonner Mill, Daly wants to buy, he says, okay, it's gonna cost you a million dollars. Okay, Daly's agent, a guy named Mike Donahue, comes up to Missoula and he says, that's absurd, you can't possibly, you can't possibly, a million dollars for a lumber mill, forget about it. And he heads back to Anaconda. Um, but Hammond knows that Daly can afford anything he asks, and the longer he holds out, the more Daly's gonna want the Bonner Mill. So Daly returns in March, of 1898, ready to bargain again. This time, the price is now $1,500,000, $50,000 higher than the previous price. Outraged, Daly goes back to Anaconda, comes back the next month. This time, Hammond bumps up the price. I love, I mean, I'm gonna try this negotiation next time I have to deal with a used car salesman. Um, Dale, you know, Hammond bumps up the price another $100,000. Uh, Donahue writes to Daly saying, Hammond is a very difficult man to deal with, but I succeeded him in getting to put a price on the business. Hammond's though enjoying this game, um, and he adds another $100,000 just to keep Daly at bay because he has to go to the West Coast. Finally, in the summer of 1898, um, as you said, August, Hammond comes back to Missoula, they begin negotiations, and finally they settle on a price of $1,480,000 an almost half a million dollars more than the original asking price. That gives you an idea of the kind of negotiator that Hammond was. Um, he kind of takes those negotiation skills on to the West Coast. Um, he leaves Missoula, what, 1893, sort of, builds a house in Portland, decides he doesn't really want that, and then moves to San Francisco, um, 1894. And I think he's finally decided he's done with M Missoula about 1896, is that right? Yeah, we're right at the turn of the century because he sold the water and electric company. Incidentally, the water company were still having troubles. You can blame that on Mr. Worden and Mr. Hammond. <laughs> Mr. So, um, the... Uh, for whatever reason, not really sure, but um, uh, Hammond um, is, starts to look outside Missoula for more economic opportunities. Um, and he and Bonner, uh, I should back up. So Bonner is Hammond's mentor. Um, Hammond really sees Bonner as, in many ways, a father figure. Um, Hammond's father died when he was about eight years old. Is that right? Something. Um, and so he was sort of raised by his, his mother and his grandparents. And so um, when Bonner comes along, sort of uh, takes Hammond under his wing, as it were, and trains him to trade as, as a store um, clerk, um, Hammond really begins to sort of model himself after Bonner. He changes his name from Andrew to A.B., as Bonner is E.L. Bonner, known, and so he, you know, sort of going by initials. He cuts his hair in the same style as Bonner. If you see pictures of the, the two of them about the same time, Ham Hammond's sort of personal style is very much uh, mimicking Bonner. He sort of really looks at him to his 
as a father figure, a mentor. Um, and they actually go to Oregon um, after the, uh, the panic of 1893, um, when the US economy collapsed. And they take a look at a couple of Oregon railroads. Um, one of them is the Corvallis and Eastern, which is a speculative road that run from uh, Yakina Bay through the Cascades. Um, and the second is the Story and Columbia River. It's the last link in the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, when they built the, the Lard built the Transcontinental Railroad, it ended in Portland. Um, and so the Astoria and Columbia was to finish it all the way to Astoria. Both of these were intended to be Transcontinental Railroads. Um, and let's see if this, there's a little pointer there. So the Astoria and Columbia is right up here in the corner and of Oregon, um, again, going from Astoria down to Portland. And the Astoria, or the uh, Corvallis Eastern, basically goes from the coast here through Corvallis and was supposed to run through the Cascades and cook up with the Oregon Short Line as a transcontinental railroad to divert traffic out of Portland to this port here. Um, Bonner um, was, um, Dale, get, catch me if I'm wrong here. They pick up the Corvallis and Eastern for about $100,000. Um, it was a sheriff sale. It included um, several steamships, uh, entire line, railroad line, lo locomotives, train cars, everything. Um, it was just a, a literally a, f a fire sale. Um, and I think Bonner was pretty keen on the Astoria and Columbia as an investment. Um, or the uh, Corvallis and Eastern, um, and where meanwhile Hammond was sort of enamored by this idea of the Astoria in Columbia. So they actually had sort of a little difference as to which railroad they thought would make them a bunch of money. Um, and uh, Bonner basically returns to Montana and he sends Hammond off to New York to try to raise money to the railroads. Uh, and Hammond finds that by the uh, mid 1890s, no one wants to invest in railroads. It's a, it's a, um, not the prime um, stock option for investors after the collapse. So, um, they, uh, Bonner's really keen on on building the, the um, Astoria or the Corvallis and Eastern, and they begin to have a falling out over that. And I don't know, Dale, if you want to. I, I'm not recalling exactly what happens. Um, they ended up with both of them. Yeah, they ended up purchasing both of them. They actually uh, um, make quite a bit of money. Um, the let's see if I have the numbers here. Um, not quite, but they. Uh, Hammond that takes that same business negotiating skill that he plays with daily, and he begins to try the same trick with E. A. Harriman, who um, is the lumber or the railroad uh, magnet for the he purchases the Northern Pacific, um, and then he also plays off um, the other railroad, big railroad guy, not Jay Cook, yeah. Hill. Thank you. J.J. Hill and um, um, uh, see, uh, Harriman against each other to try to bump up the price on this railroad. Ends up selling the Corvallis Nation, which they bought for 100000 um, for th uh, $5 million in 1906, and then um, sells off the Astoria and Columbia River Railroad about the same year um, for a similar price. So the return on investment, pretty substantial. Um, Hammond takes a lot of that money and plows it into his new company um, that he begins to build in 1900, the Hammond Lumber Company. Uh, there are five uh, investors in the Hammond Lumber Company, two from the railroads, Marcus Daly again, and um, A.B. Hammond. Um, and Bonner is not part of the Hammond Lumber Company. The first he was dead. What's that? He was dead by by 1900. No, 1902. So with the yeah. yeah. Okay, so maybe it was um, the um, uh, so he moves into the redwoods, um, purchases, uh, builds the Hammond Lumber Company. Um, it's the Vance Lumber Company, and the way he gets it's Vance Lumber Company is the largest redwood company on the West Coast, and 
uh, is actually under contract to C.A. Smith, who's number, another lumber baron in Oregon. Um, but um, Vance, who inherits the lumber company from his father, is ready to sell it. Hammond brings him to the Bonner Mill and shows him the Bonner Mill, even though it's, he no longer owns it, and shows him what he's done. He says, look what I can build. Look at this state-of-the-art timber mill. Look at this uh, city I built, uh, this company town. And um, he convinces uh, Vance to, that he should sell it to him uh, rather than to C.A. Smith. Um, and Vance takes him up on it as an option um, rather than cash. And he gets uh, a piece of uh, the investment um, based upon uh, his tour of the Bonner Mill. So a kind of connection to Redwoods as well. Um, and um, this coincides with a lot of technological innovations that occur in the 1890s. Um, move from animal power to steam power. Um, this in many ways necessitates um, clear cutting as more and more timber companies meet, need to meet their investments to pay off their bonds because they're investing in more and more infrastructure, they're investing in steam engines, they're investing in railroads, uh, and they, of course, are running up quite a debt. Um, in order to service that debt, they end up cutting more, which lowers the price of timber, in which means they need to cut more in order to make up their decreasing profit margins. And so you see this sort of cycle um, that we're actually seeing with the oil industry right now. Um, and so, you know, this pretty severe ecological um, consequences that lead the progressives, Gifford Pinchot and Teddy Roosevelt, to begin to suggest that instead of privatizing our forests, we need to um, keep them as national forests. Um, as Dale mentioned, Hammond has some problems with labor. Um, maybe Dale and Ty want to talk about, can discuss the labor in Missoula. Um, and, but uh, on the West Coast, Hammond battles the IWW. Um, he resists the eight hour day um, until World War I and basically becomes sort of a one man army against organized labor on the West Coast. I don't know if Ty was around when uh, there was uh, union organizing and they were picketing the mercantile. And C.H. Uh, McLeod, who was Hammond's manager of the mercantile, let them store their signs, their picket signs, inside the store there. And uh, so it, it was uh, kind of an interesting episode in that. Yeah, I think, and McLeod had, and Hammond, from those letters that you have in the archive, Dale, um, they seem to have a very different conception of, of labor. Um, Hammond is anti-labor, anti-raising anybody's wages, um, and McLeod keeps subtly at first and then more and more emphatically insisting that, you know what, if we pay people well, they will stay around, and that we should just, you know, acknowledge that people aren't making as much as they used to um, and they're suffering and we should take care of of our employees um, whereas Hammond is sort of a um, if they're not carrying their weight get rid of them hire a younger guy who can lift the 20 pounds move on um, and so that gets him in a again a little bit of trouble on the west coast um, and uh, he builds a transportation network, the only non-unionized shipping industry on the West Coast. Um, you can see here, one of these ships is named the Missoula. Um, the Hammond Shipping Company, um, you know, is to ship the uh, Redwoods and Coastal Dug Fur down to his facility in Los Angeles. The Hammond Navy, um, is consists of 70, 72 ships. Um, one, again, one of the largest shipping lines on the West Coast, almost exclusively for uh, lumber. One of the things that he learns, and I think Dale's dissertation is the education of a frontier capitalist. Or, is that right? Um, and one of the things that Hammond learned from his days in Montana and working on the Merck was where your money was is in retail. 
You know, forget about the lumber industry. The whole set, the, the whole it's it's in retail. It's in lumber yards. He builds the largest, world's largest lumber yard um, in uh, Los Angeles that ships lumber, especially redwoods, for railroads all over the world. Uh, China, Philippines, Hawaii, uh, Chile, um, South America, um, to the East Coast. And he begins buying up lumber yards all over Southern California, um, Arizona, um, Oregon, um, and basically is buying lumber even from other manufacturers in order to sell uh, in his retail stores. So he becomes, you know, understands this fully vertical, uh, vertical integration. And a lot of this, I think, stemmed from um, his uh, feud with Daly. Wasn't it, didn't Daly basically say he wasn't going to buy any more lumber from him and sort of force Hammer to sell it? Yeah, he put, he put up a competing store in 1889 with the Missoula Mercantile. He brought in D.J. Hennessy out of Butte and they uh, put a store in uh, that addition onto the Higgins Bank building was where the original Hennessy's was and then it moved across the street to where the old Montgomery Ward building is. And uh, that uh, didn't last very long. He brought in a wholesale company too, Daly did. I forgot, Montana Commercial Company, I think it was. And it, somehow or other, Hammond and Daly got back together again, and Hammond bought all the stock of the Hennessy Company and put it in the mercantile, and the Hennessy Company went out of business. So uh, I don't know how that worked, but that's what Hammond did. He was very good at manipulation of people. <laughs> So one of the things that's very interesting about A.B. Hammond, he shows up in Montana in 1867, you know, the height of the Indian Wars. Um, he's a woodcutter on the Missouri River, chopping you know, uh, wood, cottonwoods with an axe, sawing it into small pieces for the, uh, the steamboats to service the uh, gold mine fields. And he stays alive for a really long time. Um, you know, imagine the, what you could see happening from the 1860s, the Civil War, and all the way up until the 1930s. Um, the industrialization, you know, uh, the Hammond Lumber Company was the largest owner of um, Sitka Spruce, which was the primary timber for airplanes during World War One and World War II. Um, they manufactured ships for both wars. Um, and Hammond, of course, dies before World War II, but he's very, very active in his um, in his uh, his operations all the way up until the very end. Um, the Tillamook Fire in 1933 in Oregon um, wipes out most of his Oregon properties, but he's still got the largest uh, redwood lumber company in California. He tries to consolidate the lumber company purchases another one. During the Depression, he's busy buying lumber companies. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting is the influence of the Merck in helping the West Coast lumber industry. We usually think of the West Coast as sort of, or we think of Montana as sort of a backwater in terms of capital. But the reason Hammond's able to build such an incredible large lumber empire is because of the credit rating of the Merck. Lumber companies have basically zero credit. They're junk bonds in New York uh, during the, most of the 20th century. And he can't get loans to pay his employees. He can't get short-term loans, can't get long-term loans, can't invest in infrastructure on the basis of his lumber industry. But he can take the Merck, which has a guild edge credit rating in New York, and he can borrow money from a cloud, short-term loans. He can borrow money from the Merck. He can use the Merck's credit rating to purchase more lumber companies and build up his lumber company. And eventually, his lumber company is so large um, that it is, uh, after he dies, it's absorbed by Georgia Pacific um, and for $56 million and um, becomes one of Georgia Pacific's largest uh, in holdings. And then they become, because it's so large, they actually have to split it off and it becomes Louisiana Pacific um, in the 1980s. So just to sort of wrap up here, and then I think we haven't had any questions, but we should.
Oh, you want to back? Should we back? And then the town of Missoula. Thank you. Oh, there we go. So Dale's going to uh, touch a little bit about the Missoula octopus and uh, Missoula in the 1890s. Now this uh, this is before the washout of the 92 Higgins Avenue Bridge. Yes. Uh, that was another fight between Hammond and Higgins. Uh, the bridge, as you can see, went across the island and lined up with Stevens Avenue. Perhaps you wondered why Stevens Avenue was so wide. It was to be the main street from, uh, it was to be the main street from North Higgins out to the Bitterroot. Well, in 1892, after the bridge washed out, Higgins, this is Frank Higgins, the son, CP was dead already. Frank Higgins, the son, wanted the bridge to line up with South Higgins Avenue there. And Hammond wanted it to line up with Stevens. Well, they had an election and Higgins Avenue won. Uh, so the, the bridge that uh, went out in the flood of 1908 hooked up with uh, South Higgins Avenue. But that was another the contention. The only thing that Higgin, the Higgins family and Hammond agreed on, as far as I can remember, is they wanted the university in Missoula. That's why they did not get in the capital fight. And uh, that is why they voted for Helena for the capital, was because uh, they were promised by the Helena delegation that they would vote for Missoula for the university. Do you want to touch on the octopus, oh, the here? octopus here? Yeah, these are things that uh, Hammond owned, or Hammond and Bonner and such. This one that's crossed out is the Episcopal Church. <laughs> But he did donate the, the, the stained glass to it. Right? Yes, yes. He, he was uh, Anglican, being from New Brunswick, and uh, originally from New York. They were Tories. They did not, when the Revolution, American Revolution came along, they went up to Canada. Um, so Hammond wasn't terribly loved in Missoula. Uh, Missoulians tended to rally around the Higgins family, um, I think Bonner and Eddie were, were well loved and respected, but Hammond was not. Um, rather ruthless businessman. Um, and he, of course, labor couldn't stand him. Um, he, you know, uh, was sort of a, in some ways, uh, an early 19th or tw early 20th century uh, version of a t radio talk show host. He wrote a lot of newspaper articles and agitated um, on behalf of. Uh, of the anti-labor movement. Um, and even his fellow timber barons weren't terribly fond of him. Um, when he died at 85 years old in 1934, uh, a story circulated amongst the lumbermen of San Francisco where he lived. According to legend, Hammond with a shock of white hair, neatly trimmed goatee, impeccably dressed, just as he was in life, sat up as his coffin at the approach of the pallbearers. Six pallbearers, he thundered. Fire two and cut the rages of the others by 10%. <laughs> uh, so with that, maybe we should just uh, open up for questions, comments. Uh, Ty, if you have anything you want to add to uh, the we, conversation. We, sh we should in introduce Ty at risk of embarrassing him. Ty Robinson, um, the former in-house attorney for the Missoula Mercantile. And um, I was asking Ty beforehand, um, he, he obviously, he was hired by Walter McLeod, and he knew um, Her Herbert McLeod, uh, Walter's dad. And basically the McLeods were the face of the Missoula Mercantile for 50, 60 years after Hammond left. Um, so Ty Robinson. Well, it's a couple of things that I'd come back to. The question that you raised as to why Mr. Daly and Mr. Hammond would break, get, become enemies, but 
in a short time they'd be back together again. I, uh, when I went to work at the Missoula Merck, Kenneth Egan was the controller, and he was showing me around the Merck um, at, to see what it was like, and we were visiting about many things, and through the years, the question came up that you just asked, how come Daly got back with Hammond? <coughs> well, I think there's the story that, uh, uh, wasn't it Hammond that built the road down to, uh, the railroad down to Hamilton because the, mill, the railroads at that time by federal law were precluded, but he, he later sold the line to the Northern Pacific. Anyway, after one of their breakups, it seems that Hammond decided he was going to make a town in Hamilton, and he told, or uh, Daly told Hammond, he said, I'll build a bigger city than you can possibly build. And, of course, Hammond being Hammond just said hooey on that, paid no attention. But looking out the windows of his store, he realized all of a sudden that trains were coming from Butte each and every day, three or four of them hauling something down the Bitterroot. Well, he found out what Daly was up to down there and what he was building, called him in and said, look, let's not fight over this anymore. I'll give you a third interest and see to it that you get a third interest. It was a third interest in what was left of the octopus at that time. And when I was in the process of disincorporating, selling off in the 19, late 50s, 60s, and early 70s, it all of a sudden came to right, hit me between the eyes that that one-third interest, we had all the money put together finally, where was that one-third interest going to go? Well, Daly was dead. Daly's son was dead, but Daly's grandson had moved out of Missoula and gone to Las Vegas where he married a stripper. <laughs> Hope she isn't anywhere around. I don't want to be stupid. <laughs> She's still alive. <laughs> anyway, it turns out that this lady gets one-third of the interest of the, what was then at one time the octopus, which was a very sizable amount of money. And many of you perhaps are acquainted with Smoke Elser. Smoke's a good friend of this lady's and has been trying for the last 15 years, one, to get some money for the endowment university, two, to help the Boy Scouts, and three, to help himself. <laughs> and as of yesterday, Smoke hasn't yet received a dime from this lady. <laughs> However, he's the one that goes every spring up and opens up Dream Isle for her in Flathead Lake. You're familiar with the little island that she owns. Maybe some of you know her, just don't say that I said anything bad about her. <laughs> The other thing Dale speaks about is the end, Greg, the unions. In 1951 or 52, the unions thought they should attack the Merck once again after many tries. It was a cold winter. It's 25 below a lot of that February and March. And they're marching outside the Merck. Finally, Walter McLeod comes out and looks at them goes in and says to the manager of the men's department, see that each of those people out there get a hat and a coat right away. This was typical, I think, of the underpinnings of the Missoula Mercantile Company. While it's recognized before my time, and actually when I was there, that the wages weren't all that good. However, if you became ill, you got the best doctors in town the hospital treatment of the one hospital we had. But more than that, it was a family. And at the end of the year, everybody received a bonus, regardless of whether you had done your job or not. I think the stories, Dale, could go on. Probably I better quit before I libel myself. But <laughs> I want to say this. The McLeod family was a wonderful family, both C.H. McLeod uh, yes, we wouldn't have the universities you said, Dale, without McLeod. The thing that I learned from the family about Hammond was, as you said earlier, Greg, he was tenacious, and he, you said that he let, said letters once. So, in my files, I find that he was calling 
Walter McLeod two or three times a day sometimes to find out. And when the store went down a little during the Depression, he was on his back every day. Nevertheless, the McLeod family survived. They became a part of Missoula, and I'm grateful to them that they gave me a job. Ty, could you, could you quickly give us a dis physical description of the McLeods? You were telling me about that. C.H. Uh, Charles Herbert was a man that I'd say he had to be six. Well, to me, at first, he was a little bit of a giant. So six one in those days was giant. I was six one and seven eighths, and I thought I was pretty big. He was a broad-shouldered man, big-chested, uh, very good-looking, had a mustache, and very prone to tell an employee in a hurry what was wrong, but then pat him on the head and walk away. <laughs> His son was an, and by the way, C.H. McLeod wanted to maintain a low profile in the community. University of Montana offered him not once, but twice, Dale, uh, degrees, and he turned them down. He didn't want that publicity. C.H. Uh, Walter McLeod came along, well-trained by his dad, and he became very, well, another man that looked very much like his father, full-breasted, 200 and, had to be 210 pounds, both of them. Uh, well-dressed, good-looking men, broad-faced, Scotchman, you know, who came out of Brunswick, as you said, New Brunswick. The uh, Walter was a different type of man. He once felt that in order to, for the company to survive, changes, things are changing, he had to move out into the world, which he did. He became an outstanding man in the business world. There's an organization, a group of men, that's called the Round Table of America. The top 100 CEOs are invited each year to that. Walter McLeod was a, a regular member of that group all the time. I think, and he became a director of the Montana Power Company, a director of the North Pacific Railroad Company, a director of the Hammond Shipping Company, a director of the Hammond Lumber Company. You name it, Walter was very active active in the community here as well. It was a nice family. Unfortunately, as they say from overalls to overalls in three generations, in 1950s it became obvious the Missoula Mercantile Company and this octopus was seeing not better days but more forlorn. And it became necessary to start to sell off one by one, parts of the octopus. And I think it's interesting, and I won't go to jail for this, Dale, but the company was sold to the allied people of New York City. Years later, I was to find out that that was the mafia. In those days, the mafia had a lot of money and didn't know what to do with it, and they put it into banks and buildings and loan and got in trouble, as many of you are old enough here to re remember. Anyway, we had the Mafia here running the store for many years. One more story and I'll quit. I was called back to New York City in connection with the sale. We went to a restaurant with the president of Allied and Walter McLeod and I. I'm a young lawyer. I've been in practice all of about five and a half years, but I know everything. <laughs> <laughs> Which means I know nothing very much. We're having this nice luncheon, and the president of Allied said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Within five years, we'll build a brand new store there. And Walter said, you must. That old store is terrible. Right now, when we talk about the Merck, my answer as to what to do with it is to either burn it down or tear it down and start over. Anyway, this president made that statement. Was I smart enough as a young lawyer to say, would you put that in writing, please? <laughs> well, the years went by. No, it was not. I went to New York City twice in that. The first time I went, went in to see the president of this company to see, well, it's 15 years ago gone by and they haven't built a building. 
wouldn't you, I'd like to see the president. What was his name? I told him, oh, well, he isn't here. He moved down to Argentina a few years ago and on a fishing expedition he drowned. <laughs> I was not to give up. Three years later I went back and I was going to visit the Allied people. They were trying to sell the work and get rid of it. But a friend of mine who worked for the Rockefellers, a student that stayed in the room together out here at the university, he graduated from here and went on to become a financier for the Rockefeller family. He handled their personal financing. Well, I stayed overnight with him and told him about going to see these people, and he said, no, Ty, you'll not go near that place. And that's when I found out that they were really the real mafia. He said, you go up there and try to tell them what you want to tell them. Well, tomorrow morning we'll be picking you out of the Hudson with a pair of cement boots. <laughs> we have a connection here in Missoula still to the Hammond Lumber Company, I'm told by Dennis, keep the microphone. <laughs> Um, up up by the landfill. Do you want to explain that? You were telling me about it just now. Okay. Uh, the Carlson Ranch. Now, I've been trying to do history on this place, and uh, the owner told me the, the coal tipple that you can see up there from the coal mine, he said that those timbers were Hammond timbers that were cut in, he didn't know whether it was Oregon or California, shipped by barge up the river, up the Columbia, and then loaded on the train and brought to Missoula, and that's where that uh, mine temple at uh, the coal mine was built out of, uh, I think it was around 1900 or 1902, something like that, he built that. The Comstock Mining Company owned it at the time. And Comstock went to Nevada and they left this, it was low-grade coal, and then the family picked it up for taxes years later when Comstock quit paying taxes on it. And that that coal tipple is still standing and it is of redwood, correct? That's what I was told. I haven't been over to chip any pieces off of it to see, but <laughs> it, it, it's getting kind of leaning. You, you kind of take your life in your hand, you walk around it. Questions, comments, stories. We got lots of time here. It's uh, on the road to the dump, the Missoula dump. You go straight up. Okay. It's private property. They, they don't like a lot of trespassers, but uh, we have a little connection with him. <laughs> no, don't all talk at once. Let's have some questions. <laughs> Dale, just for the uh, benefit of the ladies present, would you talk briefly about Hammond and his relationships with women, including <laughs> Florence? <laughs> I should let Ty talk about that. He's closer to the source than. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say step on that one. <laughs> well, 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 Greg has a story that. Uh, about his relationship with women. Well, I'll let you tell earlier versions. Well, this, this may be apocryphal. <laughs> I'm not sure. The source is the Worden family. And uh, Hammond was here in the uh, in 1870s. And uh, this is the late 1870s. 
running the store and there was a young girl in town that he was interested in. So he invited her to his office. She was there. <clears throat> and apparently things were happening because her father walked in and told Hammond he would marry her. And uh, so he then sent her off to a finishing school in California and came back and married her, and that's Florence. Incidentally, Florence, Montana is also named after her besides the old hotel. And uh, apparently his patterns did not end with his um, relationship with Florence. There's a story of when he was in his 80s, still very much involved in all of his operations. Um, Ty, as you mentioned, he would call up Walter at least once or twice a week. He also went through all the phone records to make sure that they were correct or how they could save money on the phone bill. Um, very hands-on management, if you will. And he'd go periodically to visit all of his different locations up and down the West Coast. And any time he'd come for a visit to one of his offices, they'd make sure and lock the secretaries in the safe. Um, <laughs> Even though he had a cane and it was hampered by rheumatoid, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, apparently he could still chase skirts. And Olive uh, Hagen told me, that's Walter McLeod's daughter, when I was working on the dissertation, and she said, uh, well, I was going down to visit the Fenwick sisters who were uh, involved in the lumber company as well as having been here in Bonner. And she told me that she was going down to San Francisco when she was in high school to visit. She was going to go see Andrew. And Walter said, do not go see him alone. <laughs> <laughs> Dale, do you remember how old this pretty girl was when Adam married her? Uh, I, do, I do not. Uh, I assume she was around 16 or 17. Tommy Lou Warden contends she was only 14. Well, she may have been. <laughs> and I, I don't know whether that's the truth. That, I'm wondering that could be because he had to send her to finish, finishing school in San Francisco. Yeah. And I think that was one of the things that uh, Papa told him to do. <laughs> I think when they, when they actually married, she was 17 and he was 33. From what I, what I can, but that was after she came back. Yeah, so she probably was 14. You might tell us the story about his wedding day. <laughs> You'll have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> what about his wedding day? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's getting married. And everybody's at the church, ready, waiting, no Hammond. Time goes along. Finally, it's Bonner. Goes down, finds him at home there on East Front Street. And there's Hammond, all fixed out, ready to go to a wedding. Proper suit and everything, lying on his bed, hands behind his back. So, Bonner says to him, what are you doing here? Well, he said, I'm thinking. Well, he said, you're going to want any more time for thinking. You SOB, get up and get to that wedding right now. The story went a little bit further that Hammond said, I'm not sure I'm going. Bonner apparently reached down and grabbed around the throat his necktie. He did get up. He, as he apparently got married. <laughs> And to continue the story just a little bit, um, if, she, if uh, Florence was 17 when they got married, bet bef by the time she was uh, 26, she had produced six children for him. There was a brief gap between the first three of about a, a two-year gap. But um, all of those children came along very quickly, and two of them were actually born in the same year, one in January and one in December. So she was 26, and she had no children after that. And when I was interpreting her one time for this group, as a matter of fact, 
um, I was asked why there were no more children. And the only thing I can think of is that she probably sent him to his own room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping we can get, learn a little bit about Hammond's brothers because they were so instrumental to Bonner here. Um, any, anybody? Well, I think George Hammond uh, farmed up around Ovando. You'd have to ask the Hammond family here. He, I don't think he had a particularly good relationship with Andrew. Um, I'm not sure. And then Leonard, another of the brothers, uh, lived in town here and worked with the mercantile. That's one thing Hammond did. Uh, you know, they complain about the government uh, subsidizing poor people. Well, Hammond subsidized members of his family. Uh, Leonard in particular, Tom McLeod was another one. Uh, incidentally, all these people were related. The Keiths, the McLeods, the Hammonds, the Fenwicks, the Hathaways. Uh, it was all in the family, and uh, that's how he operated. His managers were all, the bank was uh, Keith, uh, the, mani or the manager of the Kalispell Mercantile was a Keith. Uh, the manager of the, uh, one thing we didn't talk about was the flouring mill business. Uh, they owned all the flour mills as far as uh, Bozeman, uh, or flour, what, grain storage or? Misco Mills. Yeah. And you can still see Misco on some of the big uh, grain elevators. Uh, so they had, it was a big operation. They had a, early on they established a store, uh, uh, sort of like IGA or whatnot. Western family or whatever those are. Every horse horse rides distance by day so a farmer could get into town and buy his stuff and get back home in one day. So you had a the big store here, you had one in uh, Arley, Demers Mercantile, you had one in uh, St. Ignatius, Beckwith Mercantile, uh, the one in Kalispell, one in Columbia Falls, one in Stevensville, uh, one in Victor, they couldn't get into Hamilton. Uh, Mr. Daly, I guess, or the Daly family didn't let them in there. They had their own store there. But every day's ride by horseback, they had a store so a farmer could get in and get home in the day. Dale, this way. <laughs> Jim Hoppeck. Several mentions of mansions were <laughs> south of the river, and everybody in this room knows of one particular one offhand, the Greeno Mansion. Why weren't there mansions all over the place north of the river? I guess before uh, the south side of the river started to be developed in 1890. And I suppose, I don't know really, uh, that's where the prime real estate was. That's where Bonner built his mansion in 1891. The old Peterson mansion that's now a bed and breakfast out there off of uh, 39th Street was where part of Hellgate High School is now. John Toole one time told me he was going to write a short book on uh, Millionaire's Row, which was uh, Gerald Avenue, because the Tools had uh, a mansion there. It's now a sorority house. Keith had his uh, place there, which is now a fraternity. Uh, Sterling, A.M. Sterling was another one that was for, or uh, A.M. Sterling is the one that ran the store in uh, Ronan. Uh, and the Fred Sterling was a vice president of the, of the old Western Montana Bank. They had a mansion there. Uh, McLeod had a house there on Gerald Avenue. But John never got, never got it written as far as I know. But there, Daly had property there. He was going to build a house there too. 
It never got built. Hammond had property there, but it never got built. So Greeno, the Greeno Mansion is an exception. Mm -hmm. Greeno was a, uh, he was a lumberman also. He floated, uh, and he <coughs> probably subcontracted from Hammond, floated timber down the rattlesnake. That's why the rattlesnake is a navigable which is, I un can't understand why the restaurant is over it, because it is a navigable stream. Uh, that restaurant's still for sale, if anybody's interested. Uh, for quite a few years now. Yeah. And then Greeno went over to, he had got into mining over uh, the town that's right at the bottom of the of lookout pass on the Idaho side. Oh, no. Uh, before Wallace. Mullen. 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 He had a big mine there, Mullen, and he was into banking in Spokane. Uh, so he, he had money, but he, he was not in any way mentioned in any of the things I've seen by, about Hammond or Bonner or any of the, or Higgins, any of the other so I will say that uh, there is a project for somebody who's interested in Worden, Francis Worden stuff, the, the things out of the old Worden and Company uh, are up at the university archives. And uh, Francis Worden was an interesting person. So was C.P. Higgins, but you won't find anything on him. The, uh, the uh, map uh, we have up on the screen there, uh, the University of Montana, when it was given approval, actually occupied a the Southside High School, which was, by because of its name, south of the river. And Dale may be able to put his finger on it. And the, the building was in such sad shape. Yeah, you would think, why would the <coughs> University of Montana be in such a obscure p part of the valley when here, here the, the right-hand side of that map shows downtown, essentially north side of the river, and maybe there is uh, Waterworks Hill up in there too someplace. Well, I maintain that if, uh, when the university was established, they were given 40 acres of land, 20 from uh, the Hammond Enterprise, South Missoula Land Company, and 20 from the Higgins family. Well, you look at these early pictures of Missoula, and this shows that if, <coughs> if the university had acquired this property for parking lots, there wouldn't be a parking problem on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, Hammond, South Missoula Land Company, and Higgins, uh, because by the time the university got here, um, they had acquired all the land south of the river. And so bringing the university was really an economic reason to try to sell lots south of the river. And so the reason the university south of the river is because they wanted, they owned the land, they wanted to sell our real estate. Now I want to open up one more thing here. The Slant Street argument. It made Missoula a hell of a place to drive. We've inherited a, a mess that was made a hundred years ago. Well, that may be something else that Hammond was involved in. <coughs> uh, somebody called me on the phone one time doing uh, research on the Knowles edition, which is the straight streets on the west side of uh, Higgins, uh, yeah, west side of Higgins Avenue. As I told you, this bridge lines up with Stevens. Well, I don't know when it happened that Knowles got involved, but somebody told me that Hammond was a major investor in the Knowles edition also, and perhaps in his irate state over the building of the bridge, he got Knowles to plot the straight streets instead of the slant ones. The slant ones were to follow uh, Stevens Avenue, which if you follow Stevens Avenue out, it goes right by Fort Missoula and up the Bitterroot. It would have been a much better than the reserve street and it was a, a wide street when it was plotted. Any other questions? Anybody want to talk about Henry Hammond? 
Well, Henry Hammond uh, operated the flouring mill here in Bonner. And when the place was sold, I'm not sure if he stuck around or not, he went out to the West Coast to Seattle. And he, he still retained interest in uh, grain milling. Well, if there are no other questions, it is past the time. For those who are interested, um, I, I can't speak for sure that they're ready, but they, uh, um, they are $5, $7 for dinner. And um, I, I, I appreciate everybody coming out on this kind of a day. It's hard to, <laughs> hard to come inside, but um, I, I really do um, thank you for coming and also thank our our panelists because um, this is this is where the expertise lies when we're talking about a, a, such an important guy for our town here in Bonner but also for Missoula and a lot of other places so thank you and a reminder Greg's books on sale over at the table I think they're 30 30 dollars and he would be happy to sign.